Hello, everybody, and welcome National Finance Brokers Day 2020, and happy National Finance Brokers Day 2020. What a, I suppose, a turbulent last few months we've had, particularly in the lending space, property space, investment space, wherever you're using a broker or you're a wonderful industry professional that is working throughout the broking industry within our market. Thank you for all your tireless effort throughout the last 12 months in helping the consumer market achieve their goals and their financial objectives, helping businesses, particularly through the current environment. We've seen those challenges that we've experiencing around the SME market, large organisations and corporations and brokers have been playing an integral role in giving guidance and advice as well at some level to help businesses make it through what we are seeing at the moment and actually get through to the other side. So today we've got a wonderful virtual summit for you with some three awesome speakers. So before I actually introduce our first speaker, um, I'd just like to say a special thank you to Clear Credit Solutions and their CEO, Peter Cole, for coming on board and being our exclusive sponsorship partner for NFBD 2020. So thank you very much, Peter, and the team at Clear Credit Solutions. So our first speaker today is a gentleman who is Australia's original money mentor with over 18 years in the finance industry. He's awarded, he was awarded the 2019 Finance Broker of the Year Award at the Advisors Australian Broking Awards, as well as the Industry Rising Star Award. His firm, Affinity Group Finance, were also ranked the fourth most in, in innovative financial services firm in Australia and New Zealand for 2019. He has thousands of customers in Australia paying off home loans in under 10 years. And yes, I said that right, 10 years, right? He has a record family in Sydney repaying a 300 or have repaid a $322,000 loan in just 1.7 years. Okay, and you heard that right, 1.7. So without any further ado, please welcome our first presenter for today, Mr. Graham Holm. Morning, Dino. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. Um, thanks for having me, Dino. It's an absolute pleasure. So, morning, Graham. Morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Time with us, mate. It's over to you. No, thank you. Thanks, Dino. I well, we might jump straight into it. I'm going to share a screen and go through a quick presentation. I'll just make sure everyone can give me a nod. They can see the screen there. Okay, Mari and Dino. Beautiful. So, folks, uh, absolute pleasure to be here with you all this morning. And whether you're an industry professional that's absolutely working your backside off at the moment, helping Australian families realise their hopes and dreams and aspirations of home ownership, or whether you're a consumer and you're looking for some guidance and support about how to get rid of debt quickly, um, over the next 10 to 15 minutes, I'm just going to give you a bit of insight into how we've actually been helping families pay off their loans in record rates. And you're going to hear from two exceptional, amazing speakers after myself. They're going to take things to the next level to help put a bow on what you can learn at this amazing virtual summit today. So let's jump straight into it. I'm going to share with you how you and your family can potentially be debt free by 2030. Um, and not only off the back of what Dino was saying last year with the Financial Review awarding us the fourth most innovative financial services firm in Australia and New Zealand, this year at the Australian Broking Awards, we're also given the most innovative financial brokerage firm. So these strategies that I'm going to share with you just at a helicopter view today are multi-award winning. They're tried, tested, ordered and proven. So take, feel free to take notes. We will jump right into it. Uh, these strategies have been shared all over the world with some really big names on stage. Uh, but the first thing I want you all to understand is that money has absolutely nothing to do with money. Money has something to do with some deep-seated, some subconscious belief system from something that your grandparents or parents perhaps taught you or told you, or something that you've picked up from friends or family at a, at a young age that's really stuck with you or provided you with a limiting belief or given you some great beliefs or some, some sad beliefs. So it's really important you understand money doesn't have anything to do with money itself. Okay, money is make-believe. Likewise, it's important that you understand that one of the most dangerous statements in the world is that it's always been done this way. And if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. And I think we can all agree that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. So for people that are saying, well, it's always been done this way, I can pop into a major four bank and, you know, I've been banking here since childhood and they have the absolute best product offering for me. 
Well, you need to be aware that by just going in and sometimes seeing your local banker, not accessing the professional services of a licensed professional mortgage broker could really hurt your family to the tune of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars over a typical 30-year loan term. So I can't stress enough, please don't do what you or your family have always done. It's time to innovate. It's time to think differently and walk with your vote with your feet and look for competition within the market. There's so much to offer in such a low rate competitive environment now. It's critical that you shop around and you look for the best opportunities in the market for your family. Now, one of the most important things for you to understand at the beginning of this process with your existing mortgage or taking out a new mortgage is literally the Latin and old French translation of the word mortgage literally translates into the word dead pledge. So until death do you part. So it's important you understand that it shouldn't actually be a 30 year death sentence or a refinance every four or five years. It's important that you get the financial literacy and the education that you may be lacking from school or tertiary education and you seek out a professional coach and mentor within the finance or finance broking industry and get someone to teach you the missing links of what wasn't in the school or, or university curriculum. I can't stress it enough, folks. We're all here to help you. Please reach out to a professional finance broker before you make an intellectual educated financial decision that could help or hurt your family. Now, importantly, having a quick look at how daily interest is calculated, because a lot of people forget that interest is calculated daily. So this family, and these are all just rounded off, but this particular family has got a half a million dollar mortgage, 4.29% per annum an average payment of around two and a half grand a month, which is a massive $30,000 a year. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want my family to hemorrhage $30,000 a year to then lose $21,450 in interest and pay a massive $58 a day in interest. So it's important that you learn and seek a coach and a mentor to see how you can mitigate that $58 a day. And if you can save five, 10 bucks a day, on the average calendar month, you'll, get, you'll give your family a massive pay rise of $300 and it can get, get even larger from there. You also need to understand that if you borrow half a million dollars, there's this secret nasty little thing that you tend to forget about, the bloody interest. So you're also going to pay about three, four $400,000 in interest over the 30 years, meaning that you borrow five hundred dollars and pay back eight, ninety, nine hundred thousand dollars $900,000. And all of the bank's interest fees and charges are front-end loaded and at the highest when the loan debt is at its peak. So you need to be aggressive because the first 10 years, you'll be lucky to take $10,000 off that loan. And you'll see on screen now, there's a representation, that red line being that amortization schedule, as opposed to what we could do in that blue line. So it's really important that you are not just making minimum repayments and you're not getting caught out with what I like to call rate bait, with this low, attractive looking, no frills, no fuss, low rate fixed loan, where you can't make extra payments and the comparison rates actually several percent higher. So also another pet peeve that you need to watch out for folks, if you're refinancing your fam's 30, family's 30 year home loan and you're four or five years in like the average family and you refinance just for a better rate, but you don't seek the guidance of a professional finance broker and you refinance again out over 30 years, not the remaining 25 or 26, you're actually doing yourself an injustice if you stretch it out again. So please make sure that if you are refinancing for a better deal for your family, you continue on that current remaining loan term that you have. It's critical in reducing debt quickly. Also, please understand, if you're doing this particular structure at the moment and only making minimum repayments plus a little bit extra here and there, that $2,500 a month that you believe is giving you that great Australian dream of home ownership is actually consisting of about $800 in interest and about, sorry, $1,800 in interest and about $800 in principal. Now, I don't know about you, I've heard int uh, rent money is dead money, but interest money is dead money as well. And it's in your best interest to give the banks as little interest as possible. The banks don't like me teaching you this, but it is so important you give them as little interest as possible, okay? Otherwise, you're in a position where after $30,000 of your family's hard-earned money, net of tax, you're only going to get about $8,500 a year off your loan. Now, 
That means that 21 and a half thousand has gone just for the privilege of saying you're a homeowner and you're very excited and very passionate about it, but then you may be getting some unsecured debt as well. Now, I don't want to take any terrible pot shots today, but a lot of families that I see have read this an amazing book, which I advocate for Scott Pape, who's written The Barefoot Investor. And that's education, so I advocate for it. But personally, I like to label it the wrong-footed investor. And the reason being is that banks know that there's a lot of money in confusion. And if you're currently structured like this family when I met them that was putting their $11,000 net pay into an everyday account, into a bills account, into the loan, into his credit card and her credit card and the car and the savings account and the holidays and I'm out of breath because that's an absolute cluster. All right. So yes, I'm short and chubby, which is why I'm out of breath. But likewise, that is a bloody disaster. Okay. It's a disaster waiting to happen. You get this perception is reality that I'm in control of my accounts and I have a smile and a cry and a fire extinguisher. Folks, interest is calculated daily. Please do not fall victim to a gimmick. Please seek professional guidance. In the current interest rate environment where the average term deposit and savings rates across the bank is zero, that's right, 0.8% per annum, you should not have money in a bloody savings account, okay? Savings benefits banks. It's for dummies. It's not for smart Australian families. The interest rate on your home loan is always going to be superior to the savings account in the current climate and for many years to come. So please do not structure yourself like this. Ideally, I would love to see families out there getting some professional advice so you can actually simplify your life. And it's very easy, folks. There's three dot points here. A fully transactional home loan, if you can find one, and a 100% offset account. Simplify your structure and do this nasty, derogatory, disgusting, bloody B word. That's right, a budget. It's not that bloody hard. If you want to call it a blueprint, a financial plan, I don't care what you want to name it, you need to have a budget. You don't get in a plane and hear the pilot say, welcome to flight VA1234. Yeah, it's pissing down rain today and I've got no clue how we're going to get there. So let's just roll the drinks card out for free. Okay. They have a plan. They will tell you due to inclement weather today, we're going to go around via hoopty goop. We're going to be slightly delayed. We're terribly sorry, but we have a plan to get you to your destination. Now, working with thousands of families, about 97% of people, when I ask them honestly, do not have a budget that they stick to religiously. If you do not have a budget that you do not stick to and you just tap, tap a -roo, remember human beings are impulsive and we tend to spend what we have direct access to. And if that's you right now, please, at the end of this session, after you listen to all the amazing speakers, please sit down and work out what your family perhaps needs as a weekly discretionary spending habit. When I met this particular family in this example, they were spending over $1,280 a week on Uber Eats, Deliveroo, you name it, takeaway, pizza, Chinese, Thai, and groceries that sat in the cupboard and got thrown out. Lunches, coffees, lattes. We sat down, we did a, jumped online, we did an online shop for everything they needed and takeaway. And you'll see the list here. We got real and we worked out they only needed $750 a week for a family of four in Sydney Metro. It's realistic. It's actually the median figure across all my families of four in Australia, a lot less, some slightly higher. So please make sure you sit down and take the time to work out your family's living expenses. You can save thousands of dollars a year just in refining your living expenses. This is where most of your money goes. I can see right down here in my belly where most of my money went. It's embarrassing. So let's pull back the purse strings a little bit and it'll also pull in the waistline a little bit if you know what I'm saying. If you're not sure, reach out to a professional. They can help you establish a structure and a strategy of what should be discretionary and what your fixed expenses are. So folks, Please, if you get nothing else from my message today, I'd really like you to understand that features beat rate. I get really frustrated when people are chasing this rate bait, these no frills, no fuss entry level loans. You need to look for a product that's fully featured with an attractive rating conjunction. So a couple of the features that you should look for as a consumer is direct salary crediting to the loan itself and free unlimited redraw. And you're going to see in a moment in the next slide why, because we want to direct all your income directly into the loan account itself 
depending on your circumstances, but 99% of the time to reduce daily interest charges and only have a weekly allowance for your food, fuel and fun. This will help with the psychology of money and stop you overspending because you'll be restricted to what's sitting in your offset account without having to actually think about or discuss with your coach or partner how much you should be pulling out of your debt to go buy a pair of Gucci shoes with bees on them, okay? I'm not sure why we do that. Our feet can't fly, but we do do it. You also need to look for free unlimited redraw. You should look for direct debit facilities from the loan itself, 100% offset, not a partial offset, 100% offset. You do want the lowest rate possible, but for a fully featured loan, not a no frills, no fuss, unless it suits your circumstances. Please consider the comparison rate. If you don't know what that is, it's not the average of all the other banks as customers keep estimating. It's the actual rate over the term of the loan. Please don't get sucked into rate bait. And please seek the advice. Get a professional finance broker that can provide you choice and opportunity of all the lenders in the market. There isn't just the big four. Get an accountability partner. Seek professional support and guidance, okay? And also, folks, look at non-retail product offerings. Ask your mortgage broker what's out there in the market that isn't just the big four. The big four are doing a great job, but they are providing retail product A and product B off the shelf. And I know when I've just lost a lot of weight and XL was too small and a double XL shirt was too big, I needed a tailor. The shop didn't offer that. So please seek some professional guidance. Don't take product A and B off the shelf. Go and seek the guidance to see what is in the market that suits your family specific circumstances so you can make every post a winner. Now let's have a quick look at the exact same family when we adopted this award-winning strategy. They didn't earn a dollar more. They took the same $11,000 net monthly income, put it into their fully transactional home loan with redraw. Then incrementally every Monday morning, we just withdrew the $750 they needed for their food, fuel and fun each week, week one, week two, on a debit card, not a credit card. And at the end of the month, we'd withdrawn $3,000. Now, I know what you're thinking. What about bills? Well, we direct debited all of the monthly bills, which on average, on average were just under two and a half grand a month, which gave us five and a half thousand dollars controlled and measured outgoings between food, fuel and fun and fixed expenses. And that left five and a half thousand dollars as a gross reduction sitting in the loan account before interest was charged. So that's a significant difference when they were doing only eight and a half thousand dollars a year. Now, have a look at the difference. Compare the pair between A and B, eight and a half thousand dollars a year versus 66,000, less the interest. Now, the interest would be a lot lower, but if we look at that and say it was still the 21 and a half, you'd get $44,550 a year off your loan. So it's a massive difference. Please seek professional advice. Please just go old school, folks. Build a simple bloody budget. Stop baffling yourself with bullshit. Oh, I've got a budget. I just don't stick to it. Then you don't have a bloody budget. Stop baffling yourself with bullshit. Here's the key. You're all sitting there right now going, well, yeah, but I, I don't believe this. Where would all the money go? Let's look at a two, two key areas. One, a credit card. This particular family had a $3,800 credit card. We're trained to look at when it's due, what we owe, and what we can get away with paying. Now we go a step further because we don't look at the little box down the bottom that I've put in red here. And you look down the bottom and go, how is this legal? 63 and a half years to repay a $3,800 credit card and $18,700 in interest. Now, it baffles me with bullshit why the home loan interest rates and savings account interest rates have dropped significantly, yet the banks have not dropped credit card interest rates, hardly at all. So please, if you don't have the money, don't bloody spend it. I can't stress it enough. The other one is if you believe you have savings while you have a mortgage, there's no such bloody thing. Put it away for a rainy day. Does that mean you don't spend it if we're in a drought? Have a look at a very quick, simple example. If you've got $10,000 in a kid's bank account, not your offset account, and let's say you're earning 2%, which you're not at the moment, that's going to give you $200 over 12 months. Let's say you lose 30% for tax, it's $140 net. Now, if you put the same money in the home loan like this family did, 
they would earn 100% of the 4.29%, $429, by not having to pay it. And there's zero tax on the saving. So it might only look like a $289 difference, but there is absolutely a compounding effect in this strategy. So if you have savings, move them into offset or the redraw. You do not have savings when you have a mortgage to the bank, folks. And this isn't to scale, but if you look at that red line, you can see that interest under the bank's loan contract would be charged on that red line. Now, the key here is if you look at the graph, by overpaying the facility and having a budget, your interest is going to be charged at that lower bottom end of the first green bar. Then each week as we incrementally draw the money required to live, interest will be charged daily on the calculated daily on these other figures. Then you'll pay your bills and we'll eat, sleep, repeat the process. So this is where you'll start to get a substantial saving. Instead of paying interest on the bank's contract at the red line, you'll start to pay it along the blue line. Now, for the average family, this particular family, instead of $396,000 in interest, they're only paying $117,000 and they're getting 20 years of life to live on their terms. The home loan is gone debt-free in 10 years. It just requires a little bit of budgeting, a fully featured product, and an accountability partner or a coach. Now, ask yourself this question, what would you do with that savings? That's a massive $279,000 in interest alone and 20 years of life to live on your terms. You might be able to buy a home for yourself, a home for your partner, a home for your children, or invest it in some other capacity. So, Think about what you could achieve if you dare to be different. Because if you believe you can, you can. If you believe you can't, you can't. You're right both times. And I'll leave you with this one, folks. Think about this for me. If you could save 20 years off your monthly repayments, no longer losing that cash flow for your family, what would that be for your family's future? Let's have a look at a simple example. For that particular family, their $2,500 a month payment times 240 months over 20 years is $600,000. So they save $279,000 in interest, but if they did continue over 30 years, they would have fed out another 600,000 in principal and interest repayments. So please think about this. I can't stress you enough. Hopefully this has given you some value to go and seek some professional advice from a licensed broker. It's been a pleasure to share with you all day. And I really can't wait to hear Mari and Mark speak shortly. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much, Graham. We'll um, we'll Thanks, get Mari Dave. on in. Right, we'll get Mari on in a moment. So if, um, we'll get our IT guys to check the filming back on. But before we throw over to our next uh, presenter, and Mari McLeod, I just wanted to tell everybody that you know National Finance Brokers Day has been running now for five years. And I thought back in 2018, when their industry was going through the Royal Commission and the banking industry was going through that, I stood up in front of a room of about 100 people in Sydney and said that the industry has gone through such a turbulent time that we get through this, it would probably be smooth sailing. And how very wrong I was, given what we're experiencing in 2020. So Graham's right. If you need that professional advice, if you need somebody to talk to, brokers live and breathe finance. They live and breed credit. And credit's always a serious thing. So just like you would do seeing a doctor if you're sick, go see a broker if you need some assistance with your finances and, and do that. And that's the reason and the objective of National Finance Brokers Day is to bring the awareness of brokers to consumers throughout Australia. So hopefully we're doing that. And Graham, thank you very much for delivering such a wonderful presentation. Um, I got out of that that I'm passing on to my partner who ditched the Gucci shoes. She doesn't need them. So thanks, mate. Thanks, Tina. <laughs> um, okay, so let's get on to our next keynote speaker. So Mara McLeod, she is a founder and principal of Astutability Group. Her passion for excellence underpins the growth and success of herself and the organisation. She's always responsible for the changing fun, for the ever-changing financial landscape. Her open mind and resourcefulness attitude have built many long-lasting relationships. She tips her 19 plus years of experience and knowledge into everything she does. She's passionate about keeping her finger on the pulse to deepen the customer experience. And she sits on numerous panels and boards to help do this. She's a strong industry advocate, hence why we're having her on NFBD today, and gives back at every opportunity, such as developing a young entrepreneurs program 
to mentor and inspire disadvantaged children. So some fantastic work. And Mara is going to talk to us a little bit about the positive attitude that will bring extraordinary results when you're dealing with a broker. So without further ado, please welcome Mara McLeod. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dino and National Finance Broker Day for having me today. Um, you're right. I'm going to be talking about how a broker can bring such positive um, insights to clients and their families whilst using our services. Uh, we are all professionals and uh, using a professional such as a mortgage broker, whether it be for consumer lending, whether it be for commercial lending, uh, mortgage lending, we actually have the knowledge. Um, so that value proposition also goes hand in hand with who we get to partner with. Um, choosing your partner as a broker is very important to bring those extraordinary results to our clients. Now, as we all know, all our clients are very, very unique. So using a broker rather than, um, at, you know, in this day and age, we've got artificial intelligence and we've got whiz-bang ways of, you know, trying to obtain a, a lend, whether it be for a personal loan, a car loan, equipment, shop fit out or a mortgage. But what customers really need to understand and I think what customers are actually bringing back to us now as brokers they want that warm fuzzy feeling of feeling secure in their choices and we give them choice and it's important to understand that brokers work with their clients to get that extraordinary result because not everyone is the same so when when customers are looking around for a broker quite often I'm asked how do you find a broker and for me personally, um, Dana, it's a little bit more than 22, uh, 19 years. It's 22 years I've been in the industry. Um, so for me, uh, finding clients and their needs and wants and for them to find me, it's a two-way street. So one, uh, being part of a, a governing body that recognises you as a professional, that is one point of call that your client can go to. They can research MFAA, FBAA, et cetera, uh, CAFBAR to see if, if you are registered. So that's a good starting point. But for brokers working in local communities and working with word of mouth and advertising, I think the key point is actually getting out there and meeting people in your community, asking for referrals with the customer base that you have. So throughout the journey of, of using a, a mortgage broker or finance broker, an asset broker, you get to build a rapport with your clients. Um, now, as, as horrible as this sounds for me, I've now got clients whose 18, 19, 20-year-old children are coming back to me. They were my first clients when I first started. And so I've been able to build um, the rapport, the ability to show that I am knowledgeable in my field, make them feel warm and fuzzy and actually hold their hands through the process. Because in today's market, it is a process. There is no such thing as a vanilla deal anymore. So by having the expertise of a broker and educating, I think brokers uh, these days have become more educators to consumers on the outside about what they should be learning on their own finances. What is a credit score? What does it look like if you jump online and start filling in your own applications? There's no extraordinary results at the end of that. So, unfortunately, um, those customers that haven't had the luxury of working with a broker before, sometimes I get those clients into my business where they've gone, oh, my goodness, I've done something to my credit score. And when you go and have a look at it, lo and behold, they've gone online and just built it out, a whole heap of applications to see which one's going to land. Quite frankly, it lands flat on their faces. So, I think key components in, in slow times like this um, and hard times is to educate your client, educate your community and your tribes that you work within. And by doing so, you're going to have a better result for your client. Uh, one of the key things that I've done over the last few years is actually starting to educate high school students on what it actually looks like to to have control of your own finances. And it's the simple things. Um, I'll give an example. I, I went out west and, and spoke to 400 students. This is a couple of years ago. And a lot of them were uh, immigrant children that had, had just come into Australia in, in their second year or third year of um, high school. And we were talking about what it means to understand how to read a pay slip. Do you get super? A lot of these children were eight, well, they're not children, they, they were 
adults, 18 to 24 year olds. So as a broker, I've gone in there and educated them on the simple things. And the simple things being, a question was asked, how do I get finance for a motor vehicle? A lot of those students did not know that you can only register a car in one name, not two. And quite often I've seen a, a young fella who, who's second or third year apprentice has gone and bought a car, put it in his girlfriend's name, and the next minute she's driving up the street to see the next bloke and he's paying for the car because the finance is in his name. Who owns the car? Not him. She does. It's registered to her. So they're the educational pieces that we as brokers can start at an early age and by getting out into the communities and just talking about what we do on a daily basis, assist your future clients as well. And your existing clients that you have, they need a lot more education in today's market space as well because we've got technologies where now we're, we're teaching customers how to download bank statements, how to use sign-on glass. So we're much more than just brokers. At the end of the day, choosing the right broker will have that extraordinary result, the outcome that the consumer is looking for. And, and we can give choice. It's not just a one-off, tap it through the system and, and see how we go. So there are also key challenges for consumers out there. If they don't choose the right product, if they don't choose the right broker, it could cost them a lot of money. So uh, to Graham's point earlier on, you go to a motor mechanic to have your motor vehicle fixed. You come to a broker to get choice and find out how we fix or how we solve a problem or have a solution to what their end result needs to be. So we are now driven by solutions for our clients because not everybody fits into the major falls anymore. So as brokers, we partner well, we, we educate our consumers. And the biggest piece around education, it's not just sending out an EDM, it's not just about throwing out flyers you actually have to start speaking to your customers more regularly. So during these times, you, you need to do things hand in hand and consumers need to be engaged. How you get them engaged is by actually asking about where they're up to, what are they looking at doing in the future? How has COVID affected you as a consumer? What are your, your goals for next year? A lot of people have got things on pause. So what I found when COVID first hit, uh, we had a lot of deals in the pipeline and then everyone's gone, oh, precautionary measures. Mari, what do you think we should do? Well, hey, I haven't been through a pandemic before either. I have been through GFC, but not a pandemic. So it was a really good conversation piece to get an understanding of, of the client's worries and of the client's goals. So you have to make sure that they marry up and you get that extraordinary result. So there were some clients that needed to put their payments on pause. I had to educate them on what that looked like and what it was going to mean for them in three months or six months' time. Now, I didn't have a crystal ball either, so we were all still navigating these, but at least they felt like someone was holding their hand. So you can you can actually sell your, your value proposition very easily to the consumer market on what we bring as brokers. We bring a level of professionalism. We bring a level of knowledge. And we've actually got that human touch still happening. Um, you know, artificial intelligence is great to a certain point, but once you start taking that human element out of it, you watch your database decline. So, again, it comes back to a high touch in the way of your personality, what you represent for your business. I work Australia-wide and it doesn't mean that I'm not in touch with my clients. I work on um, communicating with clients on a 12-week uh, marketing roster and if we're sending out EDMs, those who are opening multiple times will get a phone call out of my office at some point in that 12-week period. And it doesn't mean you're selling a product. You're actually selling your value. Your value is, hi, it's Mari here. I know we're all going through tough times and you're in Melbourne and, and I fitted your restaurant out two years ago. Tell me a little bit about how it's going. Walk me through what you're planning. So it's conversations that we all should be having with our consumers to keep our consumers educated and keep ourselves educated 
as much as we work with aggregators, uh, there's some of us that work off panel as well to find solutions for our unique customers with idiosyncrasies that sometimes just don't fit with the major banks or your, your one and two tier lenders. So again, we are not just brokers, we're actually educators. We're educating the customers we're servicing now and we're actually educating customers of the future. So if, if you're a broker and, and you're finding it a little bit quiet, a little bit tough, you need to start looking at your next four or five year prospects. They're our Gen Zers. They're the children of the customers you're servicing now. And you need to let your customers know that you, their children, their 18 year olds, need to be educated and give them that education. Um, We've got lots of great education pieces out there, whether you get them from our governing bodies or you talk to one another. We have great programs that educate um, high school students. But interesting fact, if you're out in the community working with potential customers and you're, you're letting them know what your, your skill sets are and, and what it means to work with a broker, you're going to start getting more and more people going, who was that lady? What does she do? Tell me more about her. So a few years ago, I, I started educating high school students, like I mentioned, and I had one broker say to me, well, why are you going to high school? Where, where are you going to get your business from? And I thought, you, you can't think narrow. You need to think broad. And the thing was, I was in there educating high school students. But funnily enough, I was actually educating the teachers the social workers, the school administration people that were there that didn't know some of the stuff I was talking to the children about. And some of it is basic, but unfortunately we don't buy houses all the time. We don't buy cars all the time. So they're, they're high, um, high value uh, financing that people don't do every day of the week. So, again, Dina, you did ask me the, the simple fact, what does it mean to consumers to use a broker? And I think it's that whole um, interaction, the warm, fuzzy feeling that we give, the holding of hands and understanding that if we have a positive attitude, it actually brings out the positive attitude in your clients, which then spark all these extraordinary results of referrals and settlements and all of these sorts of things. So it's all about how you communicate to maintain a good, strong client base and network within our, our, our um, communities. And you, you can be someone that just works locally or you can actually spread your community wide. And I think it's a great opportunity now. When I started 22 years ago, we were faxing one page at a time. We were ringing people and doing revs checks manually. We are so privileged today to have this technology that you can work Australia-wide. You can still give that warm, fuzzy feeling and education to your customer, whether they're in Melbourne, Sydney or Brisbane. So the key point here is, is to look at your business, look at your clients and start communicating, asking them what is it that you need from us as brokers? Have you got five minutes for a coffee? So, again, one other important thing is your smile is your logo. So if you're not smiling, you can smile down the phone, you can smile at someone, you can smile in an email. And so that's really important. Awesome. Wonderful, um, I suppose, presentation. And the highlights for me out of that, Mario, was definitely around that education piece and what brokers deliver. So I think you've summed up today's theme and the hashtag, which is the broker effect and having consumers really experience that. So that's gone. Definitely, um, that was a strong point that I was getting in the message. So thank you so much, Mario, for sharing that knowledge and that experience and keep up the fantastic work on educating, I suppose, the younger consumer market because they're the up-and-coming generation where they're going to take advantage of using yeah. the brokers. So thank you. That's fantastic. Um, and everybody for watching, keep sharing. We've been seeing some wonderful social media pics already around celebrating the broker day. Keep sharing your pics around social tag the NFBD day, tag myself, tag the speakers and use the hashtag the broker effect as well. And we'll be putting together a little collage over the next couple of days and sharing that across the social media pages to show, show people how NFBD was celebrated and how it's actually really highlighted what brokers actually doing. 
But okay, so let's get on to our final keynote speaker. Um, this gentleman has joined me on the NFBD bandwagon since day one. And I met him back in 2000, early 2016 in his office, and you'll see part of that in a moment. Um, and I tell you what, it was very, wasn't easy, but I, when I spoke to this gentleman about what I wanted to do and the reason I wanted to do it, uh, his positivity and his mindset was jumping on board because he knew there was a reason on why I was doing it and the objective of the actual initiative of National Finance Brokers Day. So I thank him personally for that, for being on the journey with me year in, year out. But this gentleman has built a reputation as a finance specialist in the top echelon of corporate life. He's always been willing to share his boardroom, his boardroom of knowledge with rank and file Australians. He's the host of the mental podcast of the Southern Cross Austereo podcast one, and that's already attracted more than 2 million downloads. He's in a unique position to share his financial experience with a growing number of, of Australians keen to bottle his advice. In 2019, he had a three speaking tour which brought together more than 9,000 small business owners and entrepreneurs who were keen to savour his advice. His sharp financial analysis has been followed and in many cases adopted in recent years through his pre previous forays on national television as a host of The Apprentice and The Celebrity Apprentice on The Nine Network and a mentor on The Seven Network. He's established a career from building disruptive businesses to challenge the market and provide smarter solutions for consumers. His mainstream position includes Executive Chairman of publicly listed Yellow Brick Road Group. Please welcome my good friend, Mark Burris. Hey guys, can you hear me all right? All good? Gotcha. Um, thanks, Dino. I guess uh, well, it's, it's interesting what uh, both Graham and Murray have just, Graham and Mar Murray have just uh, told our broker audience, and, and also I guess those people who are not brokers but happen to be tuning in, is that the importance of um, education so everything graham said is everything he went through is actually really minutiae detail education learns and it's to to, all, to some of us we said we've heard all this stuff before but to be frank with you it's the sort of stuff your clients our clients the clients of the people we deal with as brokers do not know about and they need to be educated and carried along and what murray's been talking about is equally important too and and i think murray actually added a, a, a slightly different bent to all this and that is the importance of communicating and communicating broadly and I think and I, I thank them for doing what they've just done and I think all the brokers who are listening to this if you are talking to your clients you must remember one thing is that brokers have um, evolved from where they were in the days when I established Wizard where we were just sort of basically pass-throughs I mean you know you came into my office and we gave you a loan effectively and it was the approval process was very uh, simple very fast and efficient and we asked hardly any questions and all it was about was you getting the dough. Um, and so that's a, those two aspects we just heard are, are critical and you should use all the mediums, social mediums, emails, text, telephones, to talk to your clients about the sorts of things that both Graham and Murray were talking about. Now, but I'm here to talk about, I'm old enough to talk about property markets. Um, and. Uh, and for many years, I, I go back about 20 years. I remember 20 years ago, um, uh, I used to get asked, invited by um, the uh, Economic Forum to um, have debates about the property market. And generally speaking, given we're in the lending market, um, I was always in favour of the property market and I debated all sorts of people like Harry Dent, for example, and. Uh, um, who was always negative the Australian property market because he was a, a big believer in the, um, um, uh, the what the economist view was about the Australian property market. It was always he was always predicting a crash. And if you go around predicting a crash, eventually you'll get one, um, and eventually you'll be right. And you can sort of say, "Look, I've been telling you that for the last ten years." But but Harry Harry's thinking was always flawed. And and I used to do these debates, and I remember I haven't done one of these debates for a long time, but at least fifteen years. But I remember that. It was always around a number of things, but in particular, the most important thing is we need to talk to our clients about property as an asset class. Now, and an asset class is something that gives you yield. Um, it's something you invest in for yield. Now, even if it's an owner-occupier home, there is yield involved in that, and that is there is an assumption that the property will go up in value over time. Or if you're an investor, you get a, a, a rental yield out of it, plus you get a capital gain yield out of it. And of course, 
Graham sort of correctly indicated that property is, in this country at least, is a favoured asset class in that the tax treatment of a property transaction, either as an investment property that gives you a capital gains tax, which gives you a discount on the sale, which means it increases your yield, is a very important thing. And a broker should know that and a broker needs to talk to his or her customers about that. But equally, it's even more important, even more valuable if you're an owner-occupier because it's actually tax-free. So the yield is even greater. So Property must be looked at as an asset class. And if you're a broker, you need to be communicating, just like Murray just said, you need to be communicating to your client base about this asset class. And you need, therefore, to understand about this asset class. And what are the sort of drivers of this asset class? Because we're all interested in when property markets are going to go up. And equally, some of our clients are interested in our views when property markets are going to go down. So if you're addressing your client, you need to be able to have a conversation to your client and you need to be able to talk, not necessarily as an expert, but you need to be able to talk with knowledge and confidence about that particular asset class. So, you know, we don't have um, property, uh, we don't have experts in this asset class. And, you know, real estate agents aren't experts in this asset class. Um, unlike if you go and see, you want to buy shares in the stock market, you can go and talk to a stockbroker. A stockbroker can give you views on this. And, you know, a stockbroker seems to be a specialist in the asset class. You can go and talk to a financial planner about um, other asset classes which financial planners may be experts in. But really, to some extent, this is an area that brokers can own. They can own this, um, not so much be an expert, but someone you, the client, can have a conversation with about your um, aspirations in relation to this asset class. And if I go back, it's interesting, three months ago, um, the car industry was in all sorts of problems. And they, they're three, four months ago, but as a result of COVID, people were just not going to car, car sales yards and buying cars. It's funny, you know, more recently in the last month or so, there's been a change in the mindset about people about cars. And all of a sudden, SUVs and many other new car badges are, are being sold so rapidly at the moment as compared to what it was three, four months ago. So this there's been a massive COVID change whereby there's huge demand now for cars because people are taking the view that I don't want to take a train or a bus to work anymore, so therefore I'm going to drive. There are a lot of um, discounting in, in the cities in relation to uh, where you park your car these days, so it's not as expensive today parking car in, say, Sydney as it was five pre-COVID. Um, there is a lot of companies who will um, subsidise your parking in the city, so... People are now saying, well, I need a car and I need a new car. That's one. Two, holidays are restricted. You can't, if you're in Sydney, you can't go to uh, Gold Coast anymore or you can't go to Melbourne. If you're in Melbourne, you can't go to um, Ballon or Byron you, and definitely forget about going to West Australia because you just can't go over there at all. No one's laid into West Australia. So, And this stuff is going to exist for a long time and definitely not, none of us can go overseas. Now, we can't go on our annual holidays overseas. So all of a sudden people are saying, well, I'm going to drive from Sydney to Ballina or Sydney to Byron Bay or I'm in I'm in Melbourne, I'm going to go to the Dandenongs or I'm in uh, Queensland and I'm going to drive from um, you know, Brisbane up to Noosa, uh, um, or et, et cetera. So people are saying, well, let's get a car. Let's get a good family car. So what's an interesting thing here is, all of a sudden, there's been a shift in the asset class called motor vehicle, and there's been huge demand for that. Now, where are the shifts in the property market? So as an asset class, if you go back when I, the first big boom that I ever saw in property markets where I was actually involved was driven through interest rates. Now, and that was during the late 90s. The interest rates used to be ridiculously high and all of a sudden interest rates became very low. And what happened there is that drove property markets and property prices, residential property prices in this country went bananas. And that to some extent drove my wizard business. And there was massive demand for to get a home loan, to buy a, a property, whether it was investor property or an owner-occupier, because interest rates were falling so rapidly. Because And the view, the, the, the reason for that was economic reasons, Inflation's be, inflation became ridiculously low during that period relative to where it was in the early 90s. And, the, and uh, as a result of that, Reserve Bank was uh, changing its view on where the interest rate, cash rate should be set. So that interest rate change affected affordability. And affordability is the biggest driver of property prices. Uh, it is the affordability 
it, well, sorry, it was the biggest driver of property prices. So when interest rates used to fall, property prices used to go up. So everyone used to chase property property as a, an as part of, as part of their portfolio as an asset class. But what's interesting today is there's a change. Um, interest rates are permanently low. I don't think we should be looking to interest rates today to drive affordability. It's at the margin. So, you know, Graham might be talking about, uh, you know, someone borrowing money at 3.5%. If, if the money, if the interest rates actually get falls to 3.25, it's not going to necessarily drive the, the market like six rate reductions would, would drive the market. In those days, we used to have a series of rate reductions. Now we're going to get one or two. Even at 2.19, or there's a, there's a, I think NAB's got a, a fixed three, two, two year fixed rate of 2.19 at the moment. And I, the comparison rate might be, is obviously going to be slightly higher. It might be three, 230 or something. That's a ridiculously low rate. But even that, that's not going to drive the property market. So we've got to find out what are the, and these are the things, the discussions you're going to be having with your clients. What is going to drive the property market or affordability today? And, uh, and affordability, by the way, is, you know, from you, the broker's point of view, and really ultimately from the client's point of view, is when it was interest rates driven, is translated into what's it going to cost me per month, whether I've got an interest only loan or a PI and i loan. What am I going to pay per month? They are interested in interest rates, but they want to really know what is it going to cost me per month. So you as a, an expert or, or as a broker, you need to know how to do those calculations fairly confidently, fairly rapidly, so they can get that sense what is the cost per month? Now, what is going to drive that cost lower? Well, it's quite interesting. Um, obviously, price. I mean, you know, if I'm paying five hundred thousand dollars for something as opposed to a million dollars, um, the five hundred thousand is much more affordable. Um, and uh, because the interest rate for a million dollars is the same as the interest rate for five hundred thousand dollars, so that's sort of like a constant. Um, my my repayment is going to be much lower if the price is lower. So where, how am I going to sort of get my head around where lower prices, where do they exist and where is the demand? Now, clearly, you know, you can go and buy a lower, something lower price because you go and buy an apartment. It might be a half a bedroom and uh, whatever. It might, in Sydney, you might get nothing. You might get 35 square metres for half a, half a million dollars in Sydney for an apartment. Um, sure, that's more affordable than something worth a million bucks. But at the end of the day, you know, that, that 35 square metres, you know, the chance of it going up in value over time, uh, constrained or somewhat constrained. So where am I? Where, where are the changes in society? Where's the societal change, the cultural change that is going to drive new demand? Well, once upon a, upon a time, demand was also the algorithm for demand. Not only was it about affordability, but it was also about where are the jobs. So people wanted to buy where the jobs were. So city, Melbourne, Brisbane, um, the cities is where the jobs are, the majority of the jobs are. So people knew they had to live in the city or in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane or Perth or Adelaide, but in the major cities. And th therefore, house prices by definition were going to be, well, property prices by definition were going to be driven up because of uh, demand, just sheer demand. And also, you have to look at where's the population growth and what drives population growth or what, what I mean, what we know what drives population growth is immigration and uh, people having kids. But what drives that population to grow in a certain place? It's the jobs. Where are the jobs? Now, we have seen in this last six months a change in where the jobs are. People now don't have to work, for example, in my own business here in Sydney, in uh, the Chifley Square. Um, my staff, you know, there's a couple of hundred of them, most of them now work from home. So they don't have to come into the office anymore. And some people live an hour and a half away from this office. And, they, and you know, we, we're happily allow them to work from home. And the reason why they work from home is because they don't have to travel on the train, they don't have to line up on the train or the, or the bus, they don't want to have to expose themselves to potential getting, potentially getting the virus. I don't want to expose them that to, either, to that either, as well as that it takes them a lot longer to get into work today than it used to do, so therefore they're unhappy about that. So it's actually better for me to have them work from home and as long as you know, I'm getting the output, I'm happy. So all of a sudden, um, where people work is changing. So we've got to start to think to ourselves, okay, um, where will the demand move to in terms of property and what is a, and therefore what is most affordable and most desired? I'm seeing right now a lot of demand in regional areas or places, say, outside the major metropolitan area. So it could be an hour and a half out of Sydney. It could be, at, you know, the, the old rule used to be 40 minutes out of the city. But I'm seeing that now getting stretched, getting beyond Penrith in Sydney, um, you know, 
beyond uh, Pakenham and Victoria, just just on the edge of that, just past that. And funnily enough, those properties are much more affordable because they're they're only they're much cheaper relative to where coming in closer to the city. So if you're talking to your clients, you need to start to have. If you live in um, Ballarat um, and your brokerage is in Ballarat, you need to know why buying in the region of Ballarat and just outside of Ballarat is much more affordable. And, and why it is much more desirable relative to other property alternatives closer into the town of Ballarat it, it, within the city. Or if you live in Sydney you and your brokerage is in, say, Parramatta, you need to start to think about uh, why your clients may be buying ex outside of Penrith, uh, beyond Penrith and or beyond Parramatta and those sorts of areas because... And, and you need to give value to your customer and you need to talk to your customer about this. You need to communicate both on social meetings and be open about it, not just one-on-one -on -one meeting when you're just sitting in front of the customer, but you need to have an understanding of where the prices are booming. Like if you, you think about a place like Orange in New South Wales, like it's gone off the Richter scale, um, places like Ballina and, Bar and Byron Bay, uh, gone mental, it's gone, it's gone crazy up there, prices just got out of control. Um, and there's a whole lot of reasons for that. People can now work from home. Um, um, people now know that they can get a tax deduction for part of the time they work from home because they're working from home for obvious reasons. You know, they allocate a, a room in the house, that should be tax deduction. A portion of their rent or their interest rate, I should say, is going to be payable, uh, is going to be tax deductible. There will be depreciation available for the fact that by, by virtue of the fact they've got a dedicated room and their part of their internet will be deductible, part of their telephone will be deductible, their mobile phone will be deductible. Um, there's a, they might have a coffee machine. They might say the coffee machine is deductible. All of a sudden the house, a bit like the, the cars that people now want to have to drive off to their holidays are more desirable and the car market has picked up such, so much so that to some extent they can't even get enough supply for these particular buyers. Homes, which are where it's cheaper to pay principal and interest than it is to rent, become very desirable because people are stuck there much more often, are much more conscious of being in their own home if they can be, because they don't want to have to be moving home every six months or every 12 months. And this could this, this is a new, this is a change in the way we live our lives and our working lives in particular. I think that you as a broker need to be very clear on your ability to express how important it is to invest in property today because of the changing ways people are going to um, live their lives for the future and the need for people to own their own home and or have an investment property. So I think um, and this is a positive coming out of COVID to some extent. I think one of the greatest things that, going get, that is going to come out of COVID is a far greater um, appreciation um, of the value of having your own digs, where you stay in your own digs and you can do things to your own place that allow you the flexibility to work from home, not have to change address, et cetera. And I really think that's very, very important. And you as a broker, you need to understand this stuff. And you as a broker, you need to drive these conversations with your clients a bit like Murray said, like you've got to be driving them before they come in the door. You've got to be driving them through all the mediums, telephone, email, text, social mediums, etc., and just share what you're learning and share the surprises. It doesn't have to be, a, you know, a 40-minute speech or a 10-minute speech. It just it can be two things you've learned today, two things that you've experienced today, two things you've observed, you know, like you could be observing house prices in, you know, a certain area going up rapidly. What about talking to your clients about, you know, um, if you're a first home buyer, all the benefits, like for example, in Victoria, the amount of money that you can get out of the Victorian government and the federal government if you build a new house, it's mental, it's crazy. And then you can sort of start to say, well, and by the way, there's a sweet spot in lending. You know, we don't like to lend at our organisation 95% of a $2 million borrower or a million dollar borrowing, but we're quite happy to lend 95% of a new, of a house land package which is under half a million dollars or under $600,000. And by the way, that so happens to be the $600,000 if it's a first home buyer, they get a, a, they get a grant from the state government of Victoria and they get uh, stamp duty exemptions and they get money from the federal government as well. So you know, they get this hundred, the, the $25,000 grant. So you need to build all these things up and start to drive where the demand is for people who want to participate in the property market with us, first home buyers, or whether it's people just buying investment properties, looking for tenancies, 
um, whether it's uh, uh, trying to work out um, what are the new areas, the new regional areas, uh, why would you, and what are the things that drive regional buying? I mean, hospitals, airports, important, like I, I just used an example, Ballina as an example. ballina has got an airport. Um, I mean, the Gold Coast airport's closed, but at the moment you can't fly to the Gold Coast if you're from New South Wales and drive back. But, you know, over time that will reopen. So there's two airports. There's two major art arterial roads which uh, uh, feed Ballina and or Byron Bay and, and Brunswick and the, and the greater area. Um, there's a hospital there. There's a hospital, a very good uh, hospital in the Gold Coast, effectively a brand new hospital. There's a new hospital in Byron Bay. These There's three or four really good schools. So what are all the amenities in these regional areas that make it quite compelling to start to consider that maybe you should invest in those areas? If I, I, I can't talk about Victoria or South Australia or um, West Australia, but I can talk about New South Wales. If you come down the coast, Gosford or that uh, central coast area, the only thing that used to um, be a, a problem for that central coast area was that the travelling time it took to get to if you worked in Sydney. But now a lot of these people, we have them in our organisation, now, now, they now work from home and they're quite happy living in their central coast area. And, you know, got, their houses are much more affordable. There are a lot of people very close to the beaches. Australians like to live near the water. Um, generally speaking, that, you know, there's a propensity to live near the water. Um, there's great infrastructure up there. You know, the, and the infrastructure includes things like, and it, it sounds a bit silly, but in, um, what are considered to be um, essential services like Woolworths and Aldi and Coles. I mean, they are considered to be essential. Like uh, even in Victoria and places like that where a lot of things are closed down, those all places are still open. So you, it's better and you want to be living around those areas because, you know, you might need to be able to walk there or you might need only have to travel there within a five-kilometre radius. There's all learning. There's a lot of learnings for us as brokers and people who are potential investors about where we should consider geographically and how much we should invest and how we should buy. And us as brokers, we need to understand this stuff and we need to start the conversation because no one else is. Nobody is having this conversation. I mean, Dino's putting this on and we're having a conversation with you about it, but nobody outside of us is having this conversation. And uh, I don't see, I haven't seen the conversation. I mean, I listen to just about everything and watch just about everything. Um, and I, all I'm seeing at the moment is a lot of whinging. I'm not seeing anybody having proper discussion with some experts. And if you're a broker, start talking to some experts. Start talking to real estate agents. If you want to put stuff on Instagram or Facebook, get a real estate agent to come and start telling you where the greatest, where the big demand is at the moment. Where are they seeing their investors fleeing to, to buy? So, and I'm, I, I'm, I don't want to run out of time. I'll just quickly say one more thing. There is, you need to be able to talk about the dangers the dangers that, that can occur or the risks associated with the property market. To me, the big risk is uh, renewed supply. In other words, too much supply. Right now, by the way, you're not going to get new properties put on the market. There's not going to be a, a, an increase in supply of new properties because it's very, very difficult for developers, et cetera, to get funding to do the development. It's just a very hard thing to do. Um, so once the, the current developments all run out, I think you're going to see a period of time where there's going to be not enough supply. But the sorts of things that can affect excess or cause excessive supply in the market is when owners of properties right now, investment properties, holiday homes, or just owner-occupier homes, start to put their property on the market and will sell it at any price. So what are the sort of things that would cause that to happen, that excess supply? Well, clearly the um, uh, loss of jobs. Now, we've been in this, um, you know, purple patch, like absolute Goldilocks period where we've had 5% unemployment for forever. Um and wages, whilst they haven't grown, have been steady. They haven't gone backwards. But we are seeing a little bit of a, we've got a, definitely got a jolt at the moment in terms of, or an uptick in terms of our unemployed right at the moment. Um, and, and, and I don't know how long that's going to last for. And the banks are being very accommodative at the moment and they may work, and they will continue to be accommodative into sometime next year. But there may well be some sort of cliff at some stage. We don't know. But... If for some reason the banks decide to start collecting and making people repay their home loans, um, albeit they haven't got a job and they can't, and they're no longer getting job keeper, then we're going to have a problem. And that, that's the sort of thing that could, could cause supply. I'm not telling you that's going to happen, but what I am saying to you is please monitor this and be aware of this stuff so you can talk to your client about it and be quite upfront and direct. And maybe your client wants to hang out, not buy anything until after that period passes us by and we get to see exactly how it is. I don't know. But you, these are just conversations. I'm not to just saying to you, you should convince your client of anything. Just be aware of the dangers and the advantages of investing in property. Where do they get the edge? 
and what are the sorts of things that you should be looking at and just keep having the conversation. So, well, you know, and, and for my business, Yellow Brick Road, you know, we do in excess of a billion a month currently, uh, settled lines every month. And we're seeing um, probably the two areas where we're seeing the biggest increase in activity is not in the investor market, but it's more in uh, the refinance market. So everybody's changing something that's got a three in front of it to something that's got a two in front of it. And as brokers, that's, you know, you have an obligation to make sure that your client is paying the best interest rate possible. Apart from all the other stuff that Graham said and, you know, know knowing what they're doing, you do have an obligation to make sure they're getting the best deal. And the other area we're seeing a big um, increase is in the first homeowners. Um, we're seeing a, a huge uptick in that of more recently. So refired first homeowners, first homeowners, it makes sense because that's where the government's putting all incentives. Um, so, I mean, I, I could talk for ages, but I don't have that time. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity. So I guess I want to finish off by saying, as brokers, um, every your best opportunity, you're, you're in a great business. It's, there's nothing better in the world than to be able to look your client in the eye saying your loan's approved and they get that um, unbelievable excitement that they're about to buy their first investment for the first time. Or you look at them in the eye and just say, I oh, just refinanced to save your fortune. Or you look at them in the eye and you do what Graham's suggesting and uh, you show them how they're going to pay the loan off, you know, in half the amount of time. Or you just delight them with conversation and, and you ask them how they're feeling, how are they going. And that's the best business in the world. You're not asking for any money and you're getting paid for that. That is the best business in the world. So, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mark. I... Um... I did say when we were promoting NFBD this year that it was going to be a value, a value jam-packed 60, 70 minutes, and I don't think our keynote speakers have disappointed in any way, shape, or form. So, Mark, thank you very much for sharing the insights. There's been a lot of gold there delivered to brokers, consumers, wh whoever's tuned in to actually watch. So um, I'm going to endeavour to get our um, IT guru to bring everybody on at the same time because we did have a, a quick panel discussion or questions that our keynote speakers are going to answer that I got through different social media platforms over the last few months. So hopefully everyone will be jumping on board and the speakers will come off mute when I do ask the question. So let's get into this one and then we'll let everybody continue celebrating NFBD in their own way, shape or form for the rest of the afternoon. But our first question is for Graham. Graham, this came from John. So unfortunately, I don't have a surname. For, hopefully, John's watching. John's going, should I be using an offset account or in those inbuilt redraw facilities? Which one's better for him? Mm. Good question, Dean. I mean, look, everybody should, should be based on their individual circumstances. What I would say is historically, there's been a really unfortunate trend of a lot of major institutions not correctly linking offset accounts. They're not an audited account. The loan under NCCP is. So I know my personal preference and for most of my customers in the Infinity family, we suggest you put it into the, the free unlimited redraw facility uh, and reduce that interest. But there's a psychological benefit to that, John, if you're listening, and that is that human beings are impulsive and we tend to spend what we have direct access to. So if you can keep it in the redraw as if it's off the loan and it's for savings, it's there in, a, in, you know, in need of emergency, um, but each to their own. I suggest people try to keep as little as possible in the offset and dump it all off the loan. I mean, hey, the goal at the end of the day is to get rid of that debt. But each to their own, John, I would suggest the loan. Yep. Good answer, mate. So, um, hopefully that's helped John out and you should be able to structure it. If you need to, you can reach out to Graham or any of our speakers or Ari and um, speak to a broker to get some further information. Next question is for you, Mari. This, this comes from, or was sent in by Michael. He was asking, with changes that we're now experiencing, presuming he means through COVID, um, what's the best way to find a good broker? Well, there's so many ways to find a good broker, but I think if, if you are a good broker, let's put that into perspective. If you are a good broker, you are already out there in the community and your community is already talking about you. But again, like I said in the earlier presentation, we've got governing bodies that list um, licensed brokers, registered brokers who have street cred. So there are lots of ways. And also we've got a great community that we all work within that we fall back with on one another. So there's certain things that I'm not fa fabulous at. So I will ring up a, a broker that I know who is very good at a certain 
type of lending that I'm not and I'll ask them to help me out and I will forward the client on. Because as brokers, I think sometimes we want to try and help everybody in every aspect of the business. But let's be honest, you can't be good at everything. And uh, I know myself after 22 years, my focus on, is on asset commercial lending. I'm not a, a good commercial property lender, so I have resources that I send out to. So, again, to find a good broker, you will find it within your own community and those customers are already seeking referrals from accountants, from customers that have used a broker before. Great. Yeah, good good response, Mara, and hopefully that's helped Michael if he does need a, to find a broker or another one at that stage. Um, next one came in from Julia. Mark, this one was directed to you or for you, um, and I hope you got a crystal ball ready because Julia wants to know, Mark, do you think we will see an increase in, in the property market as early as 2021? And we might, might just need to get you off mute, Mark. That's right. Sorry, Thanks. Dina. All good. Um, that's a different question. Um, I, I guess I need to know what region she's talking about. Um, if you're asking me, um, if she's asking me on a national basis, national average basis, mate, that's quite possible. The answer to that is no. I mean, if you read all the commentators like CoreLogic, et cetera, and hear what they've got to say, they're predicting um, a, a reduction in the av national average price over the next 12 months. But I, I can tell you now that there are um, districts and areas, and I said, as I said, within regional parts of Australia especially, um, where prices are, are actually going up. So you've got to be careful. You know, national averages are misleading because no one buys on a national average. I mean, you don't buy a national average house or property. You buy in a particular region. So you really need to be tracking the region. And the best way to answer her question, for, for, for that lady to find out the answer to her question, once she knows, if, if she knows which region she's talking about, start talking to some of the good real estate agents, just find out how prices are tracking. Or go on a domain or go on a core logic and have a look at what's happening with that particular district. Get proper data. Yep. Good advice. Good advice. There you go, Julia. You heard it from Mark himself. Um, there's one question for each of you, so three more remaining. Uh, Graham, Peter wants to know if... He goes, we have a mortgage of approximately 300000 um, at a 3.49 interest rate. Is it worth us refinancing? Oh, 1 billion percent, Peter. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> three point, three point, short answer, yes, mate. Uh, 3.49 is a bit heavy at the moment, as you heard Mark illustrate earlier, that most people are swapping with a three in front of it to a two in front of it. But again, as I touched on earlier, look at a combination of, as Mark said, the lowest possible rate but as well as the features that allow you to repay that loan quickly, if that's your strategy. But you need to have a strategy in mind. Don't just take out a debt and a rate and think that it'll all see itself through. You need to have a strategy in mind. But definitely look at, seek the advice of a professional finance broker, um, whoever's close to you, that if you want to see them physically, if you're in a safe COVID area, definitely look at refinancing. Hey, there you go. Uh, you heard it from Gray and Peter, so worth getting in contact with your broker. Um, Mari, this one comes from Louisa. She was asking you, my partner and I are looking to purchase a restaurant business. Uh, can a broker assist with this? And if so, what are the perks of using one? Oh, well, the perks are <laughs> all over the shop at the moment because we actually have to find a lender that will do a restaurant in the middle of COVID, just saying. But anyway, it is still very possible. I have done one in the last four months. It was an exceptional rule. But um, what they need to be looking at and considering, are they how much of it is goodwill? How much of it is equipment? So as a broker, we have a checklist. We have a true understanding. Is it going to be a going concern? Is it going to be run by the architect? So is it project managed? So these are all the things that we drill down with the customer. It is very, very possible to potentially have that broken up in various pieces, whether it be equipment funding, um, cash out funding. There's so many variances when it comes to especially a restaurant. Um, it's it's something that I like doing. It, it's certainly, it's not just a challenge. As Mark said once before, it, it's at the end game when you see the client, the relief on the client's face, when you've pulled this amazing vision that they've had together at the end of the day and you've done it all in one go. So um, there's so many key components to financing a restaurant these days. It's it's something that you do need to spend a lot of time discussing with the client, 
the architect if they're doing a fit out and also their accountant. It's not just a, a one size fits all. We may have to go off panel for some of it, depending, um, but Again, we, we line all their little ducks up in a row and we, we build the picture. And like I say to my clients, I'm going to be your Picasso. I will paint that picture for you and for the lender and we will make this happen and it will be an, an extraordinary result. So, again, it, it's about knowing your customer's um, true end result and we paint that picture to get to the end and the pathway to it. So that's the exciting part. It's all doable. It's all possible because we find solutions. Oh, thanks, Picasso McLeod. There you go. <laughs> um, so, so Louise, hopefully the restaurant business has a good takeaway structure as well, given the current environment. So, um, <laughs> and our, our last question, Mark, this one's for you and it comes in from Alex. Um, she goes, Mark, should we look at paying off our own place? I'm presuming she means a residential property here before we consider buying an investment property? Um, I, I th it's an interesting question. Um, the, I think the time to buy, I mean, everyone asks me, when, when should I buy? Should I wait for the prices to come down? Should I wait for interest rates to come down? Blah, blah, blah. The time to buy is when you can afford to borrow for me. I mean, something that hasn't been said here, and, uh, and I think it needs to be said, it's one of the things about buying a property and borrowing money is that there's not just have I got now got an asset, which is gold, that's the property, but the second asset you got, which is gold, is the actual loan approval. A loan approval today is gold because they're very hard to get. And, you know, in five years' time, we might be having this conversation, I hope I am, and we might be saying, Mark, that was correct because today to get a, a loan five years hence from now is really difficult relative to what it was in 2020. Because it's only getting harder. So... If you have the ability to borrow money today to buy another property, in other words, perhaps use your extra income over and above what you're using to service your current debt to, um, to service a second debt, for me, two debts are gold. Now, I'm not, you know, some people might say, I'll pay the loan, get rid of your debt and go and buy something else. I mean, I, I get all that. I mean, I get the fundamentals of that. But... If you, can, uh, if you can afford to borrow a second amount of money and buy a second investment property and assuming you're paying the right price for the property and you get the right interest rate and, you know, the assessment is correct, in other words, you're secure about your job, um, for me, I would be nailing the second loan because that will prove to be gold in the future. Okay. Um, there you go, Alex. You heard it from Mark and where that's heading. Um, because that actually brings our questions from our audience to a close. Uh, but before we do close off the NFBD official event for 2020, I'll just go back to our um, panel members and see if they had any closing remarks or questions or insights that they wanted to leave everybody for tuning in. So, Graham, first of all, for yourself, thank you so much for joining in and showing your strategy on how people can actually slash a 30-year mortgage to under 10 or Mate, if they're lucky down to 1.7, like that lucky family that you've helped down in Sydney, God bless them. That's um, right. Graham, any last words? Look, I really just want to touch on that and concur with Mark that if you have that serviceability at the moment, it is getting tougher. And I believe as well, it will get even tougher. So, you know, I would suggest to people that, like Mark said, make sure you're paying the right price in a good location. Yield is a significant factor. What return are you getting on the investment whilst you're waiting for that capital appreciation? But statistically and historically, we know what property does over time. So I would suggest to people, go and talk to your broker, see what your capacity is, how you're living at the moment. If you can get a loan approval now, as Mark said, for an investment property and get that depreciation and deductions and that capital appreciation over time and the cash flow in the interim, if you can get an approval for that, it is, geez, it's a precious metal. It's it's beyond gold. It's, it's platinum, isn't it, Mark? It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's something special. And that, that long-term delayed gratification of taking that action now is going to be really beneficial to them come retirement time. So I just really want to, to touch on that and, and agree with Mark there. It's really, really important they explore it. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Graham. And again, thank you for your time and thank you for sharing. Thank you, Dan. Um, Mari, uh, we really appreciate your insights, the, the work that you're doing with our younger generation across Australia, that education, that really strong education piece when it comes to 
not only just doing a loan application and putting people on their way, it's actually helping them achieve goals, whether it be now 12 months, five years time. So Ari, thank you very much for your time and any last words from yourself? Yeah, I think pre rounding it all off, you know, loans are hard to get, seeking out an expert, the education piece. I think the key point here is, which I'm seeing um, especially now, is we need to slow our customers down a little bit. They're all eager, I've got to get money. How do I get this? How do I fix this problem? But I think brokers today actually have to slow them down and really work on what's happening right now, what can we do to position you to get that lend? It's not about getting the lend here now quickly, let's do it because that could end up in decline, 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 decline. It needs to slow the customer down, use your expert panel, use your your community, your tribe that we work in as brokers to get that expert advice because, again, we don't know it all. So if I've got a tricky customer, I might ring Mark or I might ring Graham and say, hey, this is what I've got. I've slowed the customer down. How do we position it to get it set within 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 weeks. So I think key here is to really listen to the customer, slow them down and get them the best results with a positive attitude. It all lies on your positive attitude of we can. Excellent. I I summed it up perfectly, Marion, and we're all about positivity, particularly what we've been seeing. So if you need that help, you need that guidance, please go out and and speak to somebody. But Marion, thank you very much for your time. And we... Please continue celebrating NFBD till the end of the day. And I, go out. And I do have my NFBD cup, so I'll fill that up with a nice cup of tea and relax in the, in the beautiful Brisbane sunshine this afternoon, taking some time out to reflect on the last 12 months. Mark, to um, bring our wonderful virtual summit to a close, um, listen, you covered a lot of fantastic areas from economy to property investment to what people are, how they've changed about working from an office to a home environment during your presentation. Um, your key key thoughts to finish off on? I, I mean, I, I guess largely our audience is brokers. I, I, I want to say, this is, this is sort of a realisation for me, and I've been in this game for a long, long time, that one of my brokers actually said it to me the other day, um, just remember, as a broker, um, we need to promote how important it is for the customer. Not how important we are, but how important for the customer to get on the broker journey. Um what concerns me a little bit is the, the amount of loans going through brokers over the last couple of months has actually dropped off a bit because the banks are trying to push back on that and do it direct. And that's probably something to do with all the $4,000 cashbacks and all those sorts of things being getting offered to client, uh, client, uh, clients of other, of other banks. But as a broker, just remember one thing. Everything's really becomes really easy once you remember this one thing. This is the greatest job in the world. There is no better job than helping someone own their investment property, build up a portfolio, buy a home, or in Murray's case, finance their, 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 their restaurant or whatever it is that they're trying to finance. There is no better job existing, helping people win their dreams. What we've got to remember as brokers, though, is we've got to tell everybody about it. We've got to tell them how we are here to help them win their dreams. And, and we've got to do exactly what Graham and Murray have said. We've got to educate. Just don't sit on your tush all day long expecting people to walk in your door and ring you up. You've got to have this process of education, and that's not just people who you don't know, educating those you don't know. Continue to touch base with the people who are clients and make sure that you do add value to their lives. And when we went through a Royal Commission, all of us went through a Royal Commission where everyone's telling us, no, you've got to stay in contact with the client to you know, keep getting your commissions paid by the bank. You've got to give them, you know, be in touch with them once a year. You know what? We should never have been told that. We should love keeping in touch with our clients because we're doing a wonderful thing for them. And it makes if it makes them happy, it makes us happy. That's what makes us happy, Make, seeing the joy in their faces. And if we can't see that, we're not going to be very good at our job. We're not going to have a happy time ourselves. So just remember, you're doing the best thing in the world for people. It is the number one job in this country as far as I'm concerned. And people always need homes, always need investment properties. Everyone's got to have somewhere to live no matter what. And the great thing the banks have done for us is they made it so damn complicated to borrow money that, unfortunately, the marketplace can't do without us. And, and, and this, is, like, this is a reality, and we've got to remember it. And we, we, sh- we don't need to have, take advantage of it. We just need to remember it and pay it forward, play it out. 
for every one of our customers. Very, very, very well summed up, Mark. And I think that's a perfect note to um, close the official summit of NFBD for 2020. But if I can just finish off by, again, thanking our three fantastic presenters, Graham, Mari and Mark, for spending some time with me and the broader community, whether it be brokers or consumers. Thank you so much. And thank you to our consumer market as well for continuing to use brokers out there and putting their trust and guidance into what brokers are delivering. And as we always say, NFD, brokers don't sell products that help make dreams come true. So I didn't even prep Mark on that punchline. It's actually on there on our social media pages. But guys, thank you so much. Continue celebrating NFBD. We look forward to seeing everybody in 2021. Stay strong, everybody. Bye for now.